Sunny. Hello. How are, How are you? I'm good. So good to see you here. Yeah, likewise. I know we've um, chatted a few times on Clubhouse, but I think it's the first time we're actually seeing each other. Okay. Yeah, and it's so it's so nice to see you. Bye. Likewise, likewise. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Um, I think this is also a treat for the Global Jane Network audience. Um, I think most of them know me as a voice behind the Clubhouse account. So I think it's great for them to get to hear us as well. Absolutely. And it's, it's uh, the honor is all mine. I'm so glad that you're here today and you took out the time for this. So um, great. Um, I would like to introduce you first and then you can like go ahead and describe yourself further. So uh, Sunny Jain is the founder of the Global Jane Network, which is one of the biggest and widest uh, network of Jains that exist with respect to veganism and animal rights. So um, that's, that's, he's an amazing, fantastic and eloquent speaker. So Sunny, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself further? Absolutely. Uh, no, thank you so much. And, um, you know, I see a few joining in. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sunny Jane, based here in Houston, Texas. Uh, we started the Global Jane Network about four months ago. We started as a small group of friends. And, um, you know, over time, we started having these incredible events. And we started to grow and grow, you know. And now we're, you know, currently one of the largest uh, global Jane networks, like you said, in terms of animal rights, in terms of veganism. And uh, just so grateful for everything that's happened so far. Absolutely. And I think the pleasure is for each and everybody who's part of your entire team with respect to even the boards and the people who are the members. So great. Um, why don't you go ahead and share a little more about your journey into activism stuff, how you got inspired to, you know, be an activist for the animals. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I grew up as a Jain. And uh, one thing about Jainism is, you know, we grew up as vegetarians. And we've grown up with the belief that every animal has a soul, every being has a soul. And, um, and so, you know, I've always grown up with like a, a, a compassion for animals. Uh, it wasn't until about five years ago when I, um, you know, watched a few documentaries about, uh, you know, what happens in the dairy industry. And, uh, you know, for me, it was almost like a, like, almost like epiphany that I didn't realize what was happening in the dairy industry and how cows are being treated um, in, in the, you know, and how almost like dairy is directly related to these slaughterhouses. And so, you know, I eventually made the transition to go vegan. Uh, and uh, as with me, my family also joined as well. So my mom became vegan, my dad became vegan, my sister became vegan. And so we became like this vegan family at home. And, uh, and really, I think it's, uh, you know, partly due to my Jane beliefs is how I made that transition to veganism. And, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think there's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I think it just blends into the idea of how uh, religions and community themselves can manifest into the idea of animal rights and how everything is just mm -hmm. so beautiful. So um, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little more about what, I mean, uh, I remember having a discussion with you about prayer for compassion itself on Clubhouse, right? So um, yeah. I also remember you mentioning a particular scene. So if you'd like to talk about that. The prayer for Compassion is a documentary that walks the audience through, you know, various different religious communities. And essentially, there's vegan and animal welfare groups that are popping up in every religion. So whether it's Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, uh, Judaism, Jainism, uh, essentially, there's, there's people of religious belief that are starting to realize that, hey, there's um, a need for these conversations within our religious spaces. And, um, and I think, you know, the Jane Vegan Initiative, the Global Jane Network is just one, you know, kind of group that is using religion to have these conversations. Um, I often have this uh, conversation with others that we believe that, you know, if you're from the same community, uh, we have a higher probability of, of really changing minds, right? And I think a great example is, um, you know, if I go to like a, a hunter convention, right? Like a, uh, like a Southern white hunter convention, and I try to preach veganism, uh, I probably wouldn't have much success, right? They'll look at me like, who is this guy, you know? Uh, but mm -hmm. if a, a hunter that turned vegan actually goes to his convention and he talks to his community, uh, he might have a better probability, right? So people would be like, okay, you know, uh, I know him, we grew up together, um, and now we're speaking about veganism, maybe there's something there. And so that's right. kind of like our philosophy when it comes to, uh, you know, the conversation within the Jane community. Uh, you know, we believe that as Jains, uh, if we speak to other Jains about veganism, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to to have these like very tailored conversations, right? So we can talk about Jain Durham and like the scripture, tie that into veganism. We can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, go to like the Jain temples uh, and uh, we'll have a space there, right? So if we have like targeted yeah. activism, we can aim at a specific audience and try to uh, change the dialogue there. 
And, um, you know, I think in the greater scheme of things, we're just uh, one small movement in the greater picture uh, to try to push that needle. And so, you know, I think these conversations are happening everywhere. And we just want to do our part, um, at least with the Jane community, and start pushing that conversation as well. And again, just a correction, don't ever say that it's a small initiative, 13K <laughs> James, no small initiative yeah. <laughs> at all. I think yeah. that's brilliant. So really glad that you started this network because it helps, you know, pushing the movement further. Yeah. So, um, okay. Give me a little more idea about how faith ties into animal rights, the concept of animal rights. Yeah, absolutely. So in Jainism, you know, there's multiple like pillars and tenets that are uh, really what we would consider every Jain has. And I think one of the biggest tenets is Ahimsa. Uh, and in Jainism, when we talk about Ahimsa, we talk about it through our, our mind, our action, and our words. And so, uh, you know, we don't want to inflict violence through our minds. We don't want to inflict violence through our actions and even how we talk to others. And so when we talk about, you know, what's on our plate, uh, you know, most Jains are, are vegetarian, uh, you know, by default. And so uh, it's based on the idea that every animal has a soul. And when we eat meat, we're essentially causing this uh, unnecessary violence. And, uh, right. and I think, you know, similarly with veganism, um, you know, I think right now there's a lot of uh, information that's being shared that about what's happening in the dairy industry. And we're starting to learn that that dairy is very much just as violent as meat. Dairy is taking from the animal before it's slaughtered, and then uh, meat is taking from the animal after they're slaughtered, right? And so essentially, it's the same industry, it's the same, uh, everything's the same. And in fact, there's like a, uh, you know, I've heard that there's pretty much like a truck that takes cows from the dairy industry and then drives them to the slaughterhouse, right? And it just goes back and forth. And so uh, I think it's our duty to start asking these questions, like, what are we eating? Um, and, you know, how does this tie into our religion? And, um, and I can tell you that, you know, most Jains that are vegan, um, they went vegan because of their Jain beliefs that led them to, to veganism. And so, you know, I would ask everyone to kind of reflect on that and try to think about how we can do better, um, you know, as the Jain community uh, when it comes to animal welfare. Absolutely. And I think um, ever since I was a kid, I've always been taught that Jainism is one of the most compassionate religions that exist as such, right? Mm -hmm. So um, just want to ask a quick question about how, um, how did you like start breaking the taboo or what kind of challenges did you face when um, sometimes, you know, oftentimes we get this kind of excuse that, you know, culture and tradition justifies the idea of exploiting animals, right? Especially with respect to the rituals that exist. So yeah. um, how do you go about breaking this sort of myth that people have? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a common conversation. Um, I think uh, when, when it, we talk about dairy in particular, I think dairy is, is so much tied to our identity um, as, as Indians. Um, and, you know, when, when I talk to someone about, you know, the need to give up dairy, uh, many people grew up with cows, right? And, you know, you know, you might hear this often that, oh, yeah, cows were like our family members, you know, we treat them so well. Uh, but, you know, you know, like, you ask the follow up question, like, where did the cow come from? And where did it go after? Right? What happened to the male cows? Um, you know, were the calves separated from the mother cows? And you start going deeper and deeper into these questions. And you start realizing that even in these, like, specific scenarios that there is violence and there's exploitation as well. Um, and so I think uh, when it comes to culture, I think every religious community uh, and cultural like, community in general, uh, there's a need for, for modernization, for, for progression, for, for development. And, you know, every religion will evolve because the world is evolving as well. You know, the world today isn't what it was 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. And, um, and as the world evolves, uh, we have to ask ourselves, like, how can we be better as a community as well? At our Jain temples, we use so much dairy, right? So we serve dairy uh, in our pujas. We use so much milk and we use ghee for diyas. And, um, okay. and you know, it, it was a point where I would go to, like, my temple and there was nothing for me to eat there because everything was just full of dairy. And so that was really one of the inspirations for creating this initiative that, uh, you know, we believe that, like, the fundamental principles uh, you know, there's a severe disconnect between the fundamental principles and how it's being practiced today. And uh, we want to begin to open these conversations back up and ask, like, why are we doing this? Can we do it this way as well? And, um, and I think similarly, there's, uh, you know, there's Jains around the world that are having these conversations as well. Um, there's a Jain temple that recently turned fully vegan in California. 
And that was like, I think that was the biggest news for all of us, uh, which shows that we have a chance as well to make a difference. And so, uh, you know, we're hoping that we can create a community where, you know, our next generation, our future kids can go to like a Jane temple and we're talking about veganism, not vegetarianism. Absolutely. And congratulations. That is a fantastic achievement with like an entire temple going vegan. Wow. I am truly inspired by that. Okay. Um, if there are any particular scriptures within Jainism that you want to refer back to or any cultural, um, you know, that exists in the scriptures that, you know, promote the idea of veganism, could you educate a little more of me about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so this is a very interesting space. Uh, within our team, we have a professor of Jain studies and, um, you know, he was gracious to provide us like this long list of uh, various scripture lines, which talk about condoning dairy within the Jain Agams. And so this is something that a lot of people don't know. Um, you know, one thing about Jainism, it never promotes dairy. It never says that you have to consume dairy. Uh, rather, Jainism is a religion about constraint. It talks about how we should try to constrain our, our desires uh, and, and find ways where we can limit the violence that we, that we, you know, enact on other living beings. And this is a common theme throughout Jainism. Uh, and so within the scripture itself, there's multiple like, you know, areas that talk about that. Um, another interesting, you know, conversation is uh, within Jainism, we uh, essentially measure the intensity of karma by the number of sense senses a living being has. And so, for example, uh, you know, killing a cow would cause more karma, like more bad karma than killing a bug, for example, because a bug would have like two or three senses and a cow would have five senses, right? Uh, and then killing a bug would cause more bad karma than killing a plant, for example. Uh, and so even when we look at, you know, like that hierarchy of how karma is identified, you look at, mm -hmm. you know, we avoid root vegetables, right, for, for in the name of, uh, you know, ahimsa. And it's a little bit more of a complex explanation, but in general, uh, it's, you know, fundamentally behind the name of ahimsa. Uh, and so we're avoiding right. root vegetables in our diet, but we're consuming dairy that causes harm to five sense beings. Uh, and so even there, there's like a, a disconnect, right? Like, how can we hurt a cow uh, while we're trying to avoid root vegetables as well? And so, uh, you know, when we make these like, you know, smaller connections, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence within our, our Jane scripture that would tell us uh, that we should avoid dairy, uh, whether, you know, it was okay 100 years ago. And, you know, there's like a divide there. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think it was ever okay to take from an animal, but uh, it's definitely not okay now, you know, uh, given the circumstances and the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, okay. Have you ever got this argument that it's justified by culture to be consuming or, um, you know, as an excuse to be harming animals? So how do you tackle that particular argument? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and one thing I'll, you know, I'll just share for those that are kind of new in the space. Uh, you know, so there's a idea called cognitive dissonance, right? And, and essentially what that means is, um, you know, in our human mind, it's impossible for us to have two conflicting ideas at the same time, uh, which leads us to kind of make these, um, you know, these rationalizations and justifications. Um, and sometimes it sounds absurd, right? And, uh, right. and, you know, for example, you know, if I tell you that, you know, dairy causes violence to cows, uh, in your mind, you know, you obviously don't want to cause violence to cows. Right? That's like, and, you know, that's a horrific thing. No one wants to actually cause violence. Um, and so what we would say is, oh, but we need it for protein, right? As it's almost, it makes no sense, but we have to use something in our mind to justify it. And I think yeah. one, uh, and this is kind of like just my philosophy on it. I think one goal of activism is to dismantle this cognitive dissonance. So oftentimes we're yep. walking through this conversation with them that, oh, so you need protein, uh, from the dairy. Uh, what if I told you that, you know, that you could get protein from plant-based sources, right? And what about this? What about that? Uh, what if dairy is unhealthy for you, right? There's a lot of evidence now that she's not good for the human body. Uh, and then, you know, then suddenly that kind of rationalization diminishes, right? So then you might come up with another rationalization that, oh, it's in our culture though, right? That we're doing more good than bad. Uh, and then you walk them through that as well. And essentially, I think our goal is to eventually uh, walk them through this conversation where they're dismantling their mind that, okay, maybe, you know, he or she is right, that we should... Uh, try to, you know, abstain from dairy for these reasons. And so every conversation is kind of like that. And so, um, you know, appeal to culture is a, a very common conversation that we have that what will happen to the dairy farmers, you know, because suddenly we're economists, you know, we want to help, you know, uh, you, you know, it, it's something that we'll, we'll go into anything and everything to try to justify our use of dairy. And, 
Uh, when it comes to the culture, I think it's, it's important to realize that um, just because we did it 100 years ago um, or, you know, for so many years, it doesn't make it okay, right? There's so many other things uh, in humanity. Uh, you know, we've engaged in, like, you know, in racism and sexism. Uh, we had a caste system, right? Uh, you know, violence was okay, uh, you know, many years ago. And so just because we did it many years ago doesn't mean it's still okay. We should be, uh, you know, talking about as humans how we can change the way we're doing things so that we are doing what we did, you know, hundreds of years ago, because it was never okay. Absolutely. And that is so well said. And just like how you brought about the existence of various other oppressions, even within the human uh, animal realm, right? There's yeah. speciesism, which yeah. falls into why animal abuse is justified. So what are your thoughts about speciesism? Yeah, you know, um, I, I love the concept. This is actually a concept that I was introduced to uh, through Clubhouse, like through these conversations. And one thing I realized right away is uh, speciesism is something that is like built into our system. I mean, it's so deeply rooted. It's even within our language. Um, even myself, I'll catch myself many times like referring to an animal as like an it rather than a, you know, he, she, or they. And, and I feel awful because like sometimes I don't even realize that I'm speaking to an animal in that way. But then you realize that it's just so inbuilt in our culture, in our language, and everything we do. And so the idea of... Um, and, you know, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. But the idea of, uh, you know, speciesism is, uh, or anti-speciesism, essentially, you know, as humans, we are also animals, you know, and nothing about humans makes us better than animals, right? Um, you know, if you look at any feature of a human, there's probably an animal that has that feature, if not better. And even if, if not, we shouldn't think of ourselves as superior to another living being. Um, and within Jainism, there's also a lot of um, interesting kind of like connections that we made after learning about speciesism. You know, we believe that, you know, every living being has a soul and we are all equal in that sense. Right. So right now I'm, you know, born as a human and, you know, it's considered like, a, you know, a great opportunity and a blessing, uh, you know, within Jainism to be born as a human because it's an opportunity to to follow like our, our religion, our dharam, to, to spread positivity to others because we have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in my last okay. life, I could have, you know, been something else, right? I could have been an animal. I could have been, you know, anything else. And, you know, that is the same soul and just a different physical body. And so, you know, when we look at a, another animal, we shouldn't look at ourselves as superior because, you know, even within Jainism, we're all the same, the same essence, the same soul, uh, just this different mm -hmm. physical body. And, um, and, you know, yeah, you know, I heard like a monk actually say this, which I loved a lot, but, uh, you know, this monk said that we should treat all animals and all living beings with, you know, this compassion because that animal could very well be our next, like, spiritual, you know, leader, you know, in the next life. And so even in that, mm -hmm. like, idea, like, we should treat every animal with respect. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, with that idea, now we look at what we're doing to cows, right? Uh, are we really right. treating that cow with compassion and with respect? Um, you know, cows go, you know, whether in North America or in India, uh, cows go through a, a horrific life. They are, uh, you know, tortured from start to finish. Um, you know, their lifespans are cut by like 80 to 90 percent. Uh, you know, male cows are slaughtered within a few months to a year. Um, and this is once again in India as well as in North America. Um, and then female cows, um, you know, they go through this uh, process of artificial reproduction. Um, you know, they are uh, separated from their calves and then they're slaughtered as soon as they're spent and they're not able to make milk as well. And, and so if I'm thinking about how these living beings could be uh, reincarnated into, in their next life as a spiritual leader, um, I think it's, it's no way we can treat an animal. Absolutely. That's so well said. And yes, that's exactly what speciesism is. It's, it's the idea that um, you either there are two facets to speciesism. One of them would be a sense of human superiority, as you mentioned, that, you know, um, humans exclude their animality and, you know, see it as differently as savages and wilds. Yeah. And um, the other facet of speciesism is with respect to interspecies discrimination, yeah. like how your instantaneous reaction when you look at a dog is to pet the dog. But when you look at a pig or a cow is to look at them as a quote unquote meat or as a milk reservoir, right? Yeah. So when well said. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. And, you know, there's a lot of biases that we have uh, internally. And, you know, this is something that I, I notice myself. Uh, when I look at an animal like a, a monkey, for example, right, they have human features, right? They have these facial features. The eyes are, uh, you know, a head straight. And so you can see these emotions. 
But then when we look at a yeah. bird, it's it may be more difficult to see do they have feelings and how do they feel. And I, and I have a quick story. Uh, here, you know, where I live, there was actually a pigeon and its wing was, I think, broken, so it wasn't able to fly. And uh, mm -hmm. it was in a place where it wouldn't like survive long if it, it just stayed there. And so my mom actually, you know, took the initiative of bringing it home to us. And we're like, hey, let's keep it within our house for a few days and let's see what happens, right? Because, you know, if, if the pigeon's gonna die, at least we can provide some compassion and, you know, provide it food and water and you know, air conditioning. And, um, and so we lived with this pigeon for a few days. And, um, and I remember the pigeon was walking around in my room and the pigeon actually put its tail next to my foot. And, um, and for me, it was such a strange behavior, right? Like you don't understand like why, first of all, pigeons don't come close to us like that. And, uh, and it put its tail next to my foot and essentially the pigeon was showing its way of compassion. And, uh, you know, birds have their own ways of showing emotions. Sometimes they'll shake their wings, you know. Um, sometimes they'll do different things that show that, show compassion, which we may not be, you know, it might not be very apparent. And I think that moment made me realize like, wow, like even this pigeon has compassion. And it's almost like, you know, that pigeon's way of showing uh, thankfulness, right? For, you know, for feeding it, for being around it, you know. Uh, I think the pigeon realized that we're not causing harm and threat. And so mm. I think, um, you know, just speaking on speciesism, I think all animals have that ability to to feel, uh, you know, compassion, to feel pain. Uh, they all want to survive. And um, whether it's a fish, you know, once again, fish have eyes on, on the side, right? So, you know, it may be difficult, like just from biases to see that a fish can feel pain as well, but it's all living beings. And so, um, you know, in the same way, the way we treat dogs and cats, which, you know, we all love, uh, you know, we want to treat cows the exact same way. We want to treat all animals the same way. Uh, so that's just, the uh, uh, you know, one thing I wanted to share about uh, speciesism in general. And uh, since you mentioned monks, are there any particular uh, spiritual leaders within, the, within Jainism that, you know, you would recommend for people to look into their teachings? Um, mm -hmm. uh, the question regarding the Jain space and veganism, uh, I think we live in a very, uh, you know, it's a very unique uh, space right now. Uh, veganism is being talked about everywhere within the global Jain community, um, especially here in North America. It's a very common mm -hmm. conversation uh, within, uh, you know, the Jain Deirasers, which are like the Jain temples. Uh, we have a few Jain okay. temples in every major city in North America. And, um, mm -hmm. and there's many like, like teachers, Sunday school teachers, as many like, like leaders that are vegan uh, within the Jain community uh, for the very reason of, of realizing the violence within the dairy industry and realizing that as Jains, uh, we should abstain from products that hurt animals, right? Uh, you know, there's a, uh, you know, there's a few Jain vegan groups, like at, like grassroots groups that go around and they share awareness and educational material within the Jain community about veganism. Mm -hmm. um, I had mentioned like there's a Jain temple that had one vegan as well. Um, the Jain Center of Southern California, which is like our, our pride and joy. We're so proud that that entire temple went vegan. Um, we also have like a nonprofit organization um, known as Jaina, uh, you know, here in North America, which represents all like Jains and Jain Derasers. And uh, we regularly have conversations about veganism there as well. And they actually have like a committee um, known as, uh, you know, the Ahimsa Eco-Vegan Committee. So it's like a committee that talks about veganism within the Jane space. So there's a lot of like um, conversations that are happening about veganism. Um, and, you know, this is like within the last five years. So I think it's still a, a rapidly growing, you know, uh, movement. Uh, we have a lot of conventions that they'll serve vegan food like one day of the week or one day of like the three day convention. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think like with time, as we continue to have these conversations, uh, we'll be able to kind of push that needle further and further. Uh, within the religious space, this is something that, you know, we are admittedly having a lot of challenges in. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is in relation to like our acharyas, our, our Jain teachers and leaders uh, within the, the religious like domain. And so there are a few um, leaders that have mentioned that we should go vegan. So there's um, multiple videos that are coming out, um, you know, some Jain sadhus in Hindi, some in English that are speaking about, uh, you know, why we should go vegan. Uh, even like the, the founder, the co-founder of Jaina, which is our, our, our big nonprofit organization here in America, uh, they actually uh, were vegan for, I think, a, a good portion of their life as well. And so uh, there's a lot of like pockets of conversation happening. And uh, with mm -hmm. our like organization, so, you know, I'm speaking on the Global Jane Network, um, as well as the Jane Vegan Initiative. Our goal is to, uh, you know, strategize our, our efforts 
So rather than small pockets of Jains everywhere, uh, we want to be a unified con conglomerate where we can talk about veganism in a, a larger sense. And we want to show our community that this is what we need to do. Um, every Jain temple should be vegan. Um, all the modern Jain diet shouldn't be avoiding just root vegetables. It should be avoiding dairy as well. Um, you know, in terms of our clothing, uh, you know, we should avoid leather, but we should also avoid silk and wool as well. Uh, in terms of lifestyle, we should avoid going to zoos, going to aquariums, uh, going to any events that exploit animals for entertainment, um, you know, horseback riding, uh, anything that can hurt an animal, we should avoid as well. Um, this is all, I think, uh, it's almost like our imperative uh, within the Jane community that we have to like speak up and talk about these things. So I don't think this is going away. Uh, it's not a fad, uh, you know, it's here to stay. And we hope that others can really help us in making that change because we need everyone's help in this. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, another question that I have is, how do you think a faith-based activism approach is different than the other forms of activism that exist? How is it unique? Yeah. A faith-based activist approach, um, essentially, we have a unique opportunity to go into our scriptures and then to make these unique uh, comparisons to... Um, to like animal welfare and veganism. And, and, you know, like I said earlier, there's a lot of evidence within our, our religion that we should go vegan. Um, you know, we look back at our, you know, religious leaders and even for thousands of years, uh, there's like, like evidence that Jains have engaged in animal activism. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. you know, a few like major names that have, you know, they've like spoken to Kings and they convinced Kings to ban, um, you know, like animal slaughter. Uh, and this is like, you know, thousands of years ago, right? And so, right. you know, when people say that we shouldn't use religion to justify activism, um, I'll say it's the very opposite. And even like our, our, like our, you know, our Ketankars, our Jain leaders, like so many of them have, you know, there's so many stories of them saving animals. I think, uh, you know, Magra Swami is uh, our, our main, you know, our, our probably our most uh, known Ketankar. And he was a icon when it comes to animal activism and Ahimsa. Uh, you know, we have Nemi Nath Bhagwan, uh, Shanti Nath Bhagwan, uh, you know, and there's a lot of like small stories of how our thinkers would give up their lives for even the life of a small pigeon as well, right? That we're not greater than any animal uh, like that. And so I think, you know, within the Jane space, I think there's, you know, a conversation we had. And then, you know, to your question, within the faith-based space, I think, you know, us being in these communities, we have a unique opportunity to to make these connections, to to speak to those of religious faith and show them that, hey, you know, you can follow your religion and, and still be vegan. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so are there any unique challenges as such that you've faced within this unique form of activism itself? Yeah, so I guess, um, is, you know, so, you know, we often say that there's no perfect way of activism, right? And so if there was, like, we would... I'll do that, right? And so I think different things work for different people. Um, and so, you know, for example, some people are very concerned about their health, right? They want to live a healthy lifestyle. They want to go plant-based. And so when we talk to people like that, often we will start off the conversation with uh, speaking about the health benefits of a vegan diet, right? A plant-based diet. And then we would try to like in integrate uh, animal rights into it as well. Um, you know, because, you know, I think, you know, most of us will agree that animal welfare should always be the center of like the reason to go vegan. And all these other reasons are just additional benefits or additional ways to get to that. Um, Absolutely. And vice versa, right? And like I became vegan for animal rights and I eventually learned that, oh, it's also better for my diet and it's also helping the environment as well. So while I may have not cared as much about the environment as I, you know, as others, uh, I realized mm -hmm. that my diet was, you know, not negatively impacting diet in terms of what an animal-based diet would. And I could, right. um, you know, help the environment as well. So I became more... Uh, passionate about environment because of uh, veganism. So vice versa, if someone goes vegan for health or someone goes vegan for the environment, we can show them, that, hey, in addition to that, you're also helping animals as well. So, um, and sorry, so to go back to what we had said earlier, uh, different things work for different people. And so uh, for some people, um, religion, you know, is a, is a very important part of their lifestyle. Uh, it affects every decision they make during the day. And if we can make that connection that, you know, our religion says that we shouldn't hurt animals and mm -hmm. with our vegetarian diet, we are hurting animals. Like there's, 
substantial evidence. Uh, it's, it's at a point where we can't deny that, you know, cows lifespans are being, you know, cut by so much that they're being tortured in the dairy industry, uh, no matter where you live. And so I think that evidence uh, in 2021 is almost like you can't really argue it. Uh, as per a few years ago, it was more like we used to argue and talk about, oh, no, what about this, right? So now it's, we know that animals are being hurt, but how can we, uh, what, what are we going to do about it now? And so the positive about faith-based activism is you can, you, you can appeal to a very special place in a person's heart, which is religion. You can show pictures and stories of, of Jane leaders, our religious leaders, uh, and how they've you know, helped animals and you know, what we should learn from those stories. Uh, we can talk about scripture and show direct quotes and lines within scripture that talk about how we should avoid dairy as well. I think uh, conversations are happening everywhere in the world uh, towards veganism. And when the time comes, you know, our goal is to at least get our, like, you know, global Jane community, like, on board so that when the time comes, like, everyone is, like, has had their role in this movement different things click for different people. And I think we all have like an equal opportunity to make a difference. And um, I'd also say about activism in general, um, I know for, for the outside looking in, uh, it sounds like a very strong word, right? Activism sounds like a professional job, right? So people look at it as like, wow, like I can never be an activist, you know? Um, you know, I don't have the knowledge or the experience. Um, others have like a, you know, often like a, like a stereotype of what an activist looks like. And what I would tell you is, um, you know, even if you just talk to someone about how they should change their diet, I think that is a form of activism, right? Uh, you know, I know some people will go on the streets uh, and they'll do activism, which I think is a very effective uh, you know, method of activism, by the way. So for those that think that it doesn't, you know, make difference, it really much does. Like there's a lot of evidence that show that, you know, people at whole signs and do these things, like they're doing a lot for animals. And so we should never, you know, speak, you know, speak down on them, even if we don't, you know, agree with certain approaches, um, you know, we don't know what they've done for, uh, you know, what impact they've made, right? So uh, it's always like make a, um, make it a point to not criticize other forms of activism. Uh, and, you know, I would also say that, you know, it doesn't matter your background, your experience or knowledge. Uh, we all started off not knowing much about uh, animal rights or the environment or the health. And as we like, continue to be in these spaces and have these conversations like you learn and you know and I think me and Bunch would also say that we both are continuing to learn as well we're evolving we're learning we're adjusting the way we talk to people um and you know there's never like a bad time to like get involved even if it's just like sharing posts um and then eventually evolving to a point where you're comfortable with having these conversations um uh, and then um you know uh, some people like will watch like for me like I had to watch these documentaries to really get knowledge about certain like topics. Um, like now I'm at a point where like we're having conversations with doctors about veganism, right? And we're like standing toe to toe having these conversations, right? And we're able to do so because we've had these uh, conversations, we've messed up, you know, we've done well, um, and we've over time evolved and we learned what we needed to learn about how we can communicate with others. And so, um, and once again, I think we all have an equal role in being a part of this. And, um, right. you know, I'll just recommend and encourage everyone to, to just try to get involved, right? And look at activism in a different way. Uh, we can all be activists. I think everyone should try to be an activist in their own right. And, and just be around other like-minded people. And so even if you're around other like activists, I think you'll gain that confidence to go out there and, and speak up, whether it's at a public event or at the dinner table, you know, with some friends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I think... For me, I've just had this one belief in my entire lifetime. It's that when I, ha with increasing knowledge comes the responsibility to share it. Yeah. And that's pretty much what I do even with activism, right? That's the entire crux of it. You know the reality of something, so you expose that reality to the others mm -hmm. using various forms of activism. So definitely. And um, there's yeah. a question from somebody who says, any documentaries you'd recommend alongside a lot of other questions? Yeah. Absolutely. And what I'll do is I'll write this in the chat as well. We actually created like a link okay. tree, um, which shows like all the documentaries divided in different uh, sections. So this includes documentaries on Netflix, on Hulu, on YouTube. Uh, and by the way, most of these documentaries are free to access. Like, you know, they're readily available. So you can just go on YouTube and search it and find it. Um, so, you know, for those that are new in the space, right, there's essentially three, I can maybe say four major points 
uh, within the vegan movement that essentially introduced people to veganism. Um, veganism is a social justice movement. It is related around animal welfare. So like, I never want to like confuse it that it's about anything outside of animal welfare, but there's important conversations within the health space, within the environment space that talk about how vegan, how the vegan lifestyle and the diet can, can um, help humanity in these spaces. So when it comes to the environment, um, and I'll, you know, I'll just quickly share that, you know, we're finding out that the animal agriculture industry causes a lot of damage to our planet. So when we talk about, uh, you know, pollution, we talk about climate change, right? We talk about uh, deforestation. We talk about, you know, the, the trees that are being, you know, cut down. Uh, this is all being significantly progressed by the animal agriculture industry. And so, for example, to, uh, you know, so to create land for, for animals to, to grow, at, you know, for, for flesh, uh, for meat and dairy, uh, they, they're actually doing deforestation and they're cutting down the Amazon rainforest right now. And so if you remember in like 2019, there was like a, like a big like, like story about the Amazon rainforest is on fire, right? And people were outraged and people were like, what is going on? How could, uh, you know, these countries do that? Um, if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll see that the reason these forests are on fire is because uh, we're actually clearing out the land so that we can, um, you know, have more cows for beef and for dairy. Um, you know, we also talk about, um, you know, the animals. Um, so cows, when we raise so many cows at so much level, we're, uh, you know, causing pollution, uh, we're causing uh, the methane gas going to the environment, and we're causing climate change as well. Uh, so within the environment space, um, short answer is uh, Cowspiracy and Seaspiracy are two documentaries that I would highly recommend. Uh, I actually watched Seaspiracy before Cowspiracy, and I think it was just such a well-done documentary. Uh, and essentially, it goes into the idea of different industries and what they are doing to the environment. So Seaspiracy is more related to the fishing industry. Uh, you know, we talk about plastic in our oceans. We talk about, um, you know, just how unsustainable these practices are. And we're depleting our oceans. Uh, you know, we are, you know, in the pursuit of killing fish, we're also killing dolphins and sharks and whales and all these other animals as byproducts. Um, and like, it, it's a very like eye-opening documentary. So I think those two documentaries I would highly recommend. Um, sorry, I'll go a little bit faster. Uh, for, uh, and for, for health, uh, What the Health is a, a great documentary. Um, Game Changers is an awesome documentary, especially for those that are in the fitness space. Um, there's often a misconception that you can't build muscle uh, on a plant-based diet. And I think the Game Changers just took that idea and flipped it upside down. And, you know, it mm -hmm. follows like the, the stories of all these leading athletes in different um, athletic categories and how they're using a plant-based diet to, to lead. And then finally, within uh, the, the animal ethics space, I would recommend, um, and by the way, you can help me out. I think Dominion is by far the, like that documentary that everyone says that you should look at. You should definitely take a look. Um, you know, I think Unholy Cattle of India is another uh, YouTube video that I, I would recommend everyone check out. Uh, this is a uh, you know, YouTube video which shows how cows are treated in India as well. And I think it's just very important that we have this awareness. And, and one last thing I say about documentaries is that I know a lot of people are a little bit afraid to go into this because you know, you know, a lot of us are very sensitive to animal cruelty, right? And you know, seeing graphic videos, sometimes it's tough. And I understand that I was like that once. But I think it's, like Bunch said, right, it's our obligation that if we have this knowledge that we need to, we need to share others about it, right? And having watched these videos and these photos, um, you know, I can speak on myself that if I hadn't watched like a graphic video of what was happening, uh, I wouldn't have changed. I wouldn't have become vegan. And I was such a stubborn person, you know, that it, like, you know, and it's kind of sad, right? And I'm very admittedly just, I feel, I look back and I regret so much about how I used to be. But I used to be a person where someone told me that, oh, this has eggs in it, right? Like, so like in North America, like cakes and baked goods often has eggs in it, right? And it's a very like common thing here. And if someone said, oh, this cake has eggs in it, like it would ruin my day. I'm like, oh, you messed up this food for me, right? Like that's the kind of person I was. And, and I don't think anything could have changed me except for watching what is really happening. And sometimes looking at the expressions that animals will make, right, before they're slaughtered. And it, it isn't like a quick slaughter. It's not a painless slaughter, whether it's organic or whether it's, um, you know, from a local farm. In every case, the animal will go through pain. And, and there's oftentimes other animals nearby that are watching, watching the scene happen unfold, right? 
a cow can actually even like smell the scent of blood and it will it will make it feel terror like afraid and you know i think it's important that we have to watch these at least have an understanding of what is happening and yeah. once again different things work for different people uh but i think these pictures and these images have a role in our movement because um i wouldn't have one vegan otherwise so uh so hopefully that kind of answers that question yeah, it definitely does so yeah. just quickly adding on like you said uh dominion is one of the documentaries that um you know shows exactly what's happening for people who are in india please watch unholy cattle of india and daddy dairy both of them are on youtube and they're like free videos so you don't have to pay anything alongside that there are there's a brilliant brilliant documentary which is called earthlings that would definitely change your perspective about a lot of things so please do go watch that as well right so there's somebody who's asking about uh, almond soy and other milk alternatives are available in few places but come with a cost how about do how about doing raising it up to regulate the prices um okay so if i can maybe share a few words and much please feel free right so i think um if we're talking about from the economic like the macro economic side um you know because i think there was part of that question was about that uh there's a reason why animal products are cheaper than plant based products so in north america right i'll, I'll speak on north america um you know government there's a lot of government subsidies that go into animal agriculture and so essentially uh these farmers that raise you know animals for meat and dairy uh they're subsidized heavily they get they get a lot of money to keep prices low so that you know oftentimes dairy milk will be cheaper than almond milk for example although almond milk essentially is almonds in water that you can make at home right it's not a costly process but there's a reason why dairy uh milk is cheaper than almond milk right now. And so there is a systematic change that needs to happen to make plant-based alternatives more readily available and affordable. Um as vegans and as um as vegetarians that are transitioning to veganism, one thing we can do is um begin by beginning to support these different industries with demand we can bring prices down and make a product more readily available. And so a lot of the right. great the opportunities advancements in the food space that are happening in the vegan movement right now is because there's so much demand for it. So um if you're a person that has uh like the privilege, right? And so I'll speak uh I'll speak it in a very like narrow lens, but if you're a person that um has privilege that has like the ability to afford these products, uh I personally would spend an extra dollar to buy something that's more aligned with my values and you know aligned with animal welfare. then spending $1 less knowing that an animal was hurt by this product. And so uh right. um for those that are, you know, not in that economic status and you know they're looking at prices and different things, I think um mm -hmm. there is a few tricks and tips on how to be vegan on a on a budget as well. And so uh in North America, um you know, obviously you can buy plant-based alternatives, uh there's different brands. So some brands will be considered premium pricey brands, you know, like the very nice like Yoko's, you know, cream cheese, uh like really high top quality stuff, right? And then there's other brands that are more economical as well. Um right. And so, you know, there's like there's like uh, certain tips and tricks on how you can go vegan while saving money. Um I can say almond milk is almost comparable to dairy milk uh, in terms of pricing in North America now. So it's almost the same price, you know. um certain restaurants like the the vegan burger is actually about the same price as the regular burger as well and so like that that price discrepancy is shrinking significantly in North America and i think india is soon to follow india is right like right next in line cuz i think usually uh things will come to america and then within 1 to 2 years they'll come to india as well and so mm -hmm. these prices will shrink so don't think that it will always be a expensive lifestyle it is going to shrink and there's more and more innovations happening in the space which will make things more uh readily available but uh but yeah punch right. if you want to like share additional thoughts please feel free um so for me animal rights is like the most important concept and something that I hold very dear to myself so um i have grown up with the idea that exploiting animals for irrespective of whatever the cause is wrong but i was completely desensitized to the idea that cows and buffaloes are actually mothers that's why they get that right so we've always had this picture of hey there's a happy cow in the farm who's like eating and grazing and then giving us milk so that was broken for me uh, when i watched this documentary and um once i was sensitized to that it was a simple statement right it was that uh, if i'm drinking a glass of milk from another mother 
her child whose milk that rightfully is is denied that and that was what changed the entire perspective for me so i like a lot of other people went vegan overnight so <laughs> i did that but coming back to the topic of why there's a price discrepancy right so it's important to look at how um, sunny talked about subsidies that's one aspect of it but another aspect is that especially when it comes to like things like soy and corn they are the basic feed that's fed to these animals when they are like you know raising them so that is why even that is why soy is pre, uh, pr- um mm, price a little higher and is inaccessible in certain areas right but when it comes down to the alternatives what i personally do is first of all i don't personally like need a lot of milk so um i mean i haven't been a huge fan of that but one thing that you can really really do to cut down your cost and of course your carbon footprint also is that for me in india a pack of 500 grams of soybeans comes in 15 rupees just 50 rupees i get them that gives me almost 3 to 4 liters of milk i just get them put in a blender with water squeeze it out of a nut milk bag and i'm sorted so um that's one thing you can try i mean almonds definitely can get a little expensive but soy is one thing you can try then there is rice milk then there is like various other peanut milk so if you're not allergic i am so there's that you can you can try as well um but one thing that's important to also keep in mind is that the reason why these prices are higher is the dairy or any of these animal exploitation uh, quote unquote industries would not stay afloat without the government backing them with subsidies and the consumers you know being tricked into believing that there is a humane way to exploit animals so i think that's pretty much the reason but one tip that i would definitely give is just buy your own nuts buy your own uh, beans um uh, blend them and make your own milk i think that's so much more easier right and uh, of course it cuts down it's very kind to the animals as well so that works well okay uh, so we have another question which says is there a human humane way to exploit animals what do you have to say about that yeah that's um that this is also a very common question um and and you know just to give some context right uh when we're in these spaces um uh, you know and some you know kind of speaking on like the the global chain network and we'll have these spaces about um should we take from an animal by any means right and one of the conversations we'll have is like what if we didn't do artificial insemination we kept the cows with their calves uh we kept everything humane and it was a jane owned farm you know and so animals treated so well we let cows live to their old age you know and so they give like every like and, you know you know obviously mean you know this is an unrealistic scenario right but just in like this just to play along with this idea that we did everything right is it still okay for us to take from a cow uh and i would say no right i i would say it, it isn't okay i think by any means um a cow you know produces milk for its its calf and if we do any interference with that process so whether we you know take that you know even if you say like there's additional cow you know milk within the cow that we're just taking from the top right um i i think there's no uh, there's no justification to take from animals and you know my personal belief you know and so i'm kind of speaking on myself is that uh it was never okay so even 100 years ago even 1000 years ago um it was never okay for us to take from a cow that's rightfully belongs to the cow and um right. you know every other aspect of our lives the way we practice our faith and you know even just like uh practice our lifestyle is centered around not hurting animals uh this can't be an exception we can't make one exception where oh but dairy is okay it's something that isn't you know we should just try to avoid it by any means and um mm-hmm. and i would say that because of there's so many alternatives now um, i think there's over 20 plant based milks on the market right now so 20 different milks uh, maybe not in every country but they they're definitely out there um you know i think we should begin embracing these other industries uh that doesn't even give you the chance to exploit animals because any industry that profits from animals you have to expect there will be exploitation so as long as you know we're making money off an animal uh you have to expect that there is going to be abuses uh yes especially if it's profit driven right so if i'm trying to make money like so here's another way to look at it right if i'm trying to make money you want to get the most milk you can right so it's profit driven it's not driven based on the animal being at the front of the conversation so if it's mm-hmm. profit driven i need to make more milk how do i make more milk uh what we would do is we would uh, inject the cow with hormones we would uh separate the calf from the mother cow uh we would uh you know do certain things so that we can get the most milk possible 
demand is so high right now that you're not going to be able to meet demand. And so what are you going to do? You're going to um, maybe take a little bit of the milk, try to sell it. Uh, but even that, it just wouldn't be profitable. It wouldn't be sustainable even as a business from the business side. Uh, there's no way to do it, uh, you know, these businesses economically and still, you know, be a sick about it. So it's just unfortunately, um, uh, there's no way to do it. I, I would be in that stance that there's 0% way to do it in that way. I think I totally agree with you. And the only thing that we are entitled to take from animals are belly rubs and affection, nothing yeah. else. So yeah. that's pretty much what I rest it down to. Um, I think it, we are at a scenario where it's our responsibility to give back to the other more than human animals. That's what I call them or non-human animals, if you prefer to say that way. Um, so that is the only thing we're allowed to take from them. And there can be no humane way to exploit an individual who you can't even converse with, right? Because they would, I mean, they can't consent and they wouldn't consent. Just think of yourself in their perspective, right? Would you want your reproductive system to be exploited that way? No. Would you want your child to be taken away? No. So would you want you to be slaughtered in a humane fashion? No. So that's pretty much what it falls down to. Once you put yourself in their perspective, that's all it takes for us to understand why we should extend that circle of compassion to them, right? So well said, yeah. Sunny. And I think you said it perfectly, right? Like cows can't speak, right? So how, like, how do you even get consent from a cow to take their milk, right? It's not, um, you know, like we can't live in an imagining world where it's like a mutual symbol. Because I know people say this often, right? That's like a mutual relationship. We provide like it's home and we get this milk in return. And I probably said it's, but we get our, you know, her milk in return. Uh, but these are scenarios we're making in our own mind to justify yeah. that, that the, the cow wants us to take their milk. Uh, that isn't the case. Uh, there's, you know, we are forcefully taking milk from these cows that, that, you know, it was, this, this milk was made for their calves. Like there's no, um, like just, you know, biologically, this milk was made for the calves. So anything that we do that takes from this animal, we're essentially stealing. We're, uh, we're stealing from the animal. Absolutely. Yeah. And ultimately what it falls down to is that um, fear seeing different animals, right? They have motherhood, they have parenthood, they have friendships. And most importantly, they have the same amount of suffering, the degree of suffering that either me or you or anybody else would go through, right? And that yeah. is what it falls down to. If they can suffer, then stop the suffering. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's another question, which is with the ESG framework coming up, I'm hoping more, po okay, it's a comment, more mm -hmm. positive move uh, towards vegan practices. So. Mm -hmm. Any comments you have on that? Um, yeah, I think um, I think kind of goes back to that earlier point, right? That the more that we begin to, you know, grow our community and support vegan businesses and products, the more mm -hmm. change will happen. Um, if you're within the ESG space, uh, whether if you're within like the entrepreneurship space, right, starting a business, um, you have an opportunity to align your business with your values. And so there's an idea of of both social impact and sustainability. Uh, and essentially, we're thinking about business ethics now and how can we do business in an ethical way, right? So, right. Uh, you know, I guess for like the Jane space, right? If I'm a Jane business owner, I wouldn't sell meat, right? Uh, so as Janes that are vegetarian, like you wouldn't have a restaurant that sells meat because it wouldn't be aligned with their values. So similarly, we want to think about dairy in the same way that we, we want to have businesses that, that impact change without mm -hmm. uh, compromising our values. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, okay, interesting, a really, really interesting question, mm -hmm. which is, um, in fact, there are two, so they're from Sujay who say, do you follow any communication technique for advocating for the animals? Yes, we do. So, uh, so we actually created this like whole mind map. Um, and so essentially we have these different bubbles on our strategy for how we're going to target the Jane community, uh, and, like mm -hmm. for the specific like conversation, but this can go for anything. Right. And so, right. um, the, the first um, method that I would recommend is leveraging virtual spaces. So uh, we live in a very unique time right now. Uh, we just all went through a collective pandemic and suddenly everyone's online. Uh, we know how to use Zoom, right? So suddenly, like, I didn't even know what Zoom was two years ago. Like, it was something that was not in my radar. Uh, but now we have, like, you know, Zoom events. We have Clubhouse, of course. So, you know, that's, I think, such an awesome platform for those that use it. And so um, using these like leveraging these technologies to have these conversations, I think is going to be really important for the vegan movement. 
Um, so what we do right now is we regularly have panel-based events and we have open format events. So panel-based events will be, we'll find like a few subject matter experts, we'll bring them to the stage, we'll have like a round table discussion and then we'll allow people to ask questions. A uh, very awesome right. way to have events. Um, and we'll have events related to like vegan cooking. It could be uh, vegan, like Jane Dharma and veganism. It could be about um, health, environment. Uh, and then, you know, maybe sub conversations within that space. Uh, we can also have open format conversations. So this could be more of, hey, we're a support system and we want to support you. So come to the stage, introduce yourself. We're here for you. And, you know, you know, one, like I think a lot of people will say that one of the most important things about that transition to veganism uh, is having a support system because, you know, you're obviously going through this very radical lifestyle change. You're changing everything that you know about food and the world you live in. And you're it's completely redoing that, right? When you look at the menu, suddenly there are certain ways to order at a, at a restaurant and you have to like relearn that again. Um, food at home, like when you do grocery shopping, like there's so many changes that are happening and are continuously being pressured by perhaps family members, perhaps friends, you know, you're going out to a restaurant uh, and it's a lot you're going through, right? And so having a support system, I think is really important for that transition. And a lot of people that, you know, unfortunately they weren't able to make that commitment to go fully vegan. A lot of times um, um, the reason they are able to succeed is partly due to not having that support system. And so having like a virtual space, like through Clubhouse and Zoom, is like our way to, to recreate these spaces to show you that, hey, um, you may be the only vegan in your, in your family or in your world, but hey, there's a lot of others out there as well. These are just like a few different strategies that I look at as uh, like from an active standpoint, but I think virtual world, uh, taking full advantage of technology, I think it will be really important. Absolutely. That was so expansive and insightful as well. <laughs> a follow-up question is, um, since the entire crux of the faith is non-violence, right? So how important is non-violent direct communication with while advocating for animals? So I think it's very important that our fundamental principles are aligned with our practice. And I think that is the biggest challenge that we're facing right now is that there's a severe disconnect, right? There's, um, you know, and, you know, and I say this critically, but I also say this out of like constructive, like to help the community as well, right? And so there's a professor, um, like, a, like a very like renowned professor uh, that had made a convert comment about like the Jain community, which really much resonated. And the, com the comment was that most Jains are vegetarian, but very few are vegans. Many Jains will wear silk, they'll, they'll wear wool, They'll use um, animal products during our pujas. Uh, at our temples, we use a lot of animal products there. Uh, at our weddings, we use a lot of animal products there. And, and that was just an observation he made. And uh, he was absolutely right, right? Like we can't be upset about that comment because it's true that while we preach nonviolence and we're, you know, even to the smallest being, we're trying to avoid hurting bugs and small animals. Mm -hmm. Um, and we will fast for a week so that we can limit the violence we cause the world. Yet we're consuming so much dairy, right? Uh, it, it's just a severe disconnect uh, between our principles and our practice. And, um, and I think it's, it's very important that we make these distinctions and we have these difficult dialogues. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to activism and the nonviolent uh, direct action, uh, people will uh, react a different way. So some people, some like people, will talk to and will do activism. They are grateful. They're like, "Wow, thank you for letting us know about this." Right? Uh, and it's just a wonderful moment when that happens because they realize that our intentions are good and and their intentions are good too. Like we all want to help animals, and now that new information is out there, we need to evolve so that you know, based on this new uh, available information, um, some people will take it as an attack, right? Some people will take it as an attack on our religion. Um, some people, which it, which it is not, right? It's a, um, we think of it as a extension of our um, application of, um, of the religion. Uh, some people will think of it as an attack on their identity, right? Because dairy is so intertwined with our identity. Uh, you know, I grew up with cows, cows are like family members. How dare you say that, we're, that I'm hurting animals, right? Um, and no matter how nicely you say it, like you will have those personalities. And when that time comes, I think it's, uh, I think, you know, so I'm a little bit more strong in my approach and others aren't, right? And, and you know, no approach is right or wrong, but um, I'm okay with, ha with butting heads with strong personalities 
Because I don't think every interaction has to be positive. Like we wish it was, right? That we all walk out of this conversation more knowledgeable, grateful, you know, thankful. Sometimes it's not like that, right? And personalities will bump heads. And, you know, there's, mm -hmm. you know, I've lost friends from these conversations. Uh, I've, when I say friends, not really friends, but acquaintances, right? Uh, <laughs> to be honest. But, um, but, you know, they come off upset, you know, and, you know, we'll say Machami Bukadam, right? Which is like, in, in Jainism, it's like our way of saying, I seek forgiveness, right? And it's like a very, it's a beautiful thing we should always say, like, you know, that, hey, you know, I seek forgiveness if I knowingly or unknowingly hurt you. But even then, some people won't take that. But um, they try our best to be um, kind and you're polite, but you do want to stay firm and on your, um, stay confident in your belief system. Because if you're not confident and upfront, people will run you over. And we, you know, we have like a lot of our vegan friends that get run over by people that talk louder than others, you know, that are, that they're okay with yeah. yelling and you're not okay with yelling. Uh, but you have to stay strong and, um, and know that there's others that are, that are watching these conversations oftentimes and, and they're looking at the whole like conversation. So even though you may think that, all right, he yells, so he won, <laughs> you're right, like quote unquote won. Uh, at the end of the day, I think you have positively impacted others that were just watching and they were onlooking. And so, yeah. so that, that would be my thoughts on that. Perfectly well said, because um, for me, if I am like um, unaware about something and I'm, you know, probably you are aware about it and you're talk talking to me and you start screaming at me or you use like a blaming method, I would just be desensitized to it. I'll be like, hey, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Right. And that's exactly what happens when you use like a violent action, uh, violent uh, behavior in your action. But uh, again, it's important to be stern about it, like Sunny said, like you said. Uh, so being uh, firm about what it is that you want to say and, and make sure that the other person gets it through compassion. So, um, Sunny, you mentioned a lot about how you're creating a support group for people who transition. So how can people like join in uh, to the Global Gen Network? I think step one is even just being in the spaces. So for those that are even listening in, um, like I'm so grateful for all of you because that alone is the first step is being in these conversations. Uh, when you make that decision that, hey, either now or sometime in the future, I want to, uh, you know, transition to a lifestyle that doesn't hurt animals, right? And I think, you know, most of us, either believe that or we hope that we can reach that point one day, right? And so once you make that step towards that decision, I think being a part of these conversations, these groups, uh, I can say for me, you know, so first I can speak on the Global J Network. Uh, so, you know, we'll attach a link on this where you can get involved, get connected with our grooms. Uh, we have a specific Instagram group uh, called the Jane Vegan Initiative, which is dedicated to just uh, animal rights and uh, within this intersection with Jainism. And, uh, and in this page, and, you know, there's a lot of links for, like, different WhatsApp groups and places where you can be around other people. Um, we will post conversations within the Jain community about veganism. Uh, anytime a, a Acharya or a monk speaks about veganism, we will post it. We'll make sure we post it. Uh, we are translating our languages into, like, Hindi and Gujarati. Uh, we are posting Jains talk about veganism. Uh, which, there's a lot of Jains that are. So, you know, if you're, you know, and, you know, um, I would say, and this is not like a like scientific uh, estimate, but if they had 10 Janes in a room, I think at least two of them would be vegan uh, right now in the time we live in. I know that sounds like a small number, but I think in like the greater mindset, that's a lot of vegans, right? And so countless Janes are going vegan right now in every part of the world. And um, mm -hmm. and so there are, there are Janes that are vegan right now. Absolutely. So uh, also do follow the Global Jain Network, follow the uh, Jain Vegan Initiative. Those two are like great posts where they also, I've seen a lot of posts where there are discussions, the documentaries, there are panel discussions, and there's definitely the aspect of um, breaking out festivals and how, you know, they also, in a sense, promote the idea of compassion towards everybody. So please do go watch out for that. Um, Sunny, I think this would be um, a, a very interesting and a very significant part of your entire life, which is how does one get started into this form of activism? In this form of activism. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes uh, when we talk about like, you know, affecting change, right? Uh, so like in the vegan spaces, we'll talk about individual change and like collective change, right? That's often a way to look at it. Uh, but um, I look at activism in two different stages. There's top down approach and then there's the bottom up approach. And so right. the top down approach is essentially 
people of influence, right? So this could be a Sunday school teacher. This could be a president of the Jane Temple. This could be, um, you know, someone on the executive committee of our nonprofit organization, right? So if you're someone of, of with the authority and the position to influence others, uh, you can affect, uh, you know, systematic change from that level. And I think the, a good example of this is the, the Jane Center of Southern California that went completely vegan. It was because the president, um, like I think one of our major donors and the president was vegan. And he pushed this idea that, hey, we need to go vegan. Uh, and because he was a person of authority and influence, he was able to make systematic change. And people will just follow underneath, you know, they'll follow because of that whole conversation. Um, if you're a, a Sunday school teacher, you have the ability to influence many people. You could be um, talking to like the kids, right? Like the, like, the, like the kids that are learning about religion and you can you know, incorporate the idea of animal welfare in there as well. Uh, and a great example of that is, uh, you know, Praveen Uncle within our, our Jain community, uh, he actually wrote like the Sunday school books, right? Uh, like that teach about Jainism and he's a vegan. And so if you go like the page one of our Pachal books, it says that uh, avoid, all Jains should avoid dairy. It's, it's right there blatant. You know, we're, we're incorporating this into our religion uh, at a very fundamental level. And so, you know, we're just kind of planting the seeds, you know, but this is something that a lot of Jains of big uh, influences are trying to do. Um, even like, you know, I, I would even speak on myself, right? So, you know, the Global Jane Network, the Jane Vegan Initiative, uh, we started our own group because some of the more traditional Jane organizations, they may be afraid of having certain conversations, right? Because a lot of these organizations are built on donations. Uh, they have to report to certain people. They have to make sure certain people are happy. Uh, as for the Global Jane Network, we are just a group of, of people who are very decentralized and we're all uh, willing to rock the boat as needed, right? So we're not afraid to rock the boat to have these difficult dialogues. Uh, and we think it's for the betterment of our community. Like we think this is the evolution right. of our community is when smaller groups start evolving. And so, uh, you know, so even the Global Jane Network, we, we had um, this campaign called uh, Give Up Dairy for Pajushin campaign. And Pajushin is like our, our very religious Holy Week of Jainism where everyone's fasting. So everyone's already fasting. People are not drinking water. People are doing this, doing that. And so we're throwing like our own kind of, um, you know, idea that, hey, we should give up dairy uh, for Pajushin. And we found that many Jains are going vegan because of like this, like, most Jains that are vegan um, have went vegan during Pajushin. Like, so we're finding that, hey, there's this interesting like opportunity. So every year during Pajushin, we, like, we go really hard on that. So that is a top-down approach. Uh, sorry, I, I realized I was rambling. Um, the bottom up approach is essentially grassroots efforts. This is talking to individual people. This is putting signs on the walls. And so like, I think, a good, uh, I hope they don't take this down, but so I'm a part of the Jane Society of Houston. And three years ago, when the Jane Center of Southern California went vegan, I created like a flyer that, hey, their temple went vegan, we should go vegan too, right? And I posted this flyer on the wall, like, like a bulletin wall at the Jane Society of Houston. And it's been there for three years. No one has taken it down. <laughs> and so uh, I don't even know how many people have walked by it and they've looked at it, you know, it, it says vegan in big bold letters, you know, but um, that's an example of a bottom up approach. And I think both approaches are equally important. So we want to get people of authority to make these changes. We need like individual people, like every person, every auntie, every uncle, they need to start talking about veganism. And together we can implement this systematic change um, towards veganism. And, um, and I'll just remind that I think, uh, you know, my opinion is the goal isn't to make every person vegan. The goal is to make enough people vegan so that we can affect change, whether it's within our community, whether it's our social structure, within the government, you know, uh, there's always going to be people that, that are, you know, and, you know, I hate to say, but, you know, there's going to be people that are, there's always going to be murderers in the world, right? There's always going to be bad people in the world, right? Like we can never... Do, you know, there's nothing we can do about that, right? But what we can do is we can make systematic change. We can make a cultural shift. We can make it that, hey, it is not okay to consume dairy uh, by any means. Uh, and we want to make that the, the common thought. So if you consume dairy afterward, at least you know that, hey, there isn't a religion backing me up for this, right? Uh, yeah. And so, you know, uh, top-down approach, the bottom-up approach, uh, I kind of incorporated into like the Jane community, but this applies to all communities. Uh, this is a place all like systems. So even like in the workplace, if you work at a company, uh, very same thing, top down approach, bottom up approach. Uh, I think these are great like ways to look at activism. Right. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, Sunny, any, any other thing that you want to mention before we like close off for the live? And I have a couple of other questions which are like casual. So anything else that you want to talk? 
about yeah, us. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, no, and I love this conversation. And I can talk all the way, by the way. So uh, thank you all for kind of like listening in and, and hearing me speak about this. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of just reiterate that idea of activism. I think no matter who you are, right? So whether you're, um, you know, someone from the younger generation, the older generation, whether you're a parent, a student, I think we all have an equal opportunity and a role to, to help animals. And yeah. activism doesn't have to always mean uh, like a specific stereotype of what activism looks like, because you can even just talk to a friend and that is a form of activism. Um, it doesn't require you to be an expert. You know, you don't have to be someone uh, that's a subject matter expert. You know, it doesn't have to be a profession. Uh, anyone could be an activist. Um, no one knows all the answers. Uh, we're all learning here. Uh, none of us would um, say that we know everything or we're not changing. Um, every day we'll like, continue to evolve our approaches. I'm learning something new every day from different activists as well. And, um, and I think that, you know, we should all begin to look at it in that sense. Um, you could be someone that starts a food blog, right? A vegan food blog. That is a form of activism, right? You share recipes. You could be someone that, um, that is on the streets and is protesting. Uh, once again, I think that's a very effective form of activism. And I never want to discredit that. No matter what anyone thinks, I think it's, it's so important that we have people like that as well. Um, and it could be someone that's like, like me hanging out online and just, you know, mass posting stuff in WhatsApp groups and doing that, right? Uh, we all have an equal role when it comes to helping animals. And, um, and really, our goal is we want to just push the needle towards veganism. So however you do it, um, you know, we appreciate you, we want you, uh, and we thank you for, for everything that everyone's doing for, uh, you know, this movement. And I also want to, you know, thank Bunch, you know, if I get a chance, you know, I just want to thank you for everything you're doing as well, because I've learned so much from our conversations um, on Clubhouse as well. And I'm grateful for this opportunity. I think a lot of people in the Global J Network, um, they haven't heard me speak. Um, some of them don't even know my, how I look, right? Like, they know me as a voice behind Clubhouse. So uh, I think it's a great opportunity to reach out to even, like, my audience as well, or our audience as well, and show them that, hey, this is something that we're really passionate about. Uh, within our Jane community, we will continue to talk about veganism, right? We, we are not going to shy away. Um, our goal is we want to help the Jane community and we want to have these difficult dialogues, right? And so um, we welcome everyone to be a part of our community and, um, and join us for this. I'm extremely grateful for your food blog because mm -hmm. I just really enjoy the aesthetics of it and it makes me drool every single time I watch it. So <laughs> you do follow that account of Sunny as well. But most importantly, I think the Global Gen Initiative is such a, I mean, the Global Gen Network is such a, it's, it's spread across. It involves both. It involves a top-bottom approach. It involves a bottom-up approach. And it's so expansive in its nature. And so I'm extremely grateful for the work that you've been doing. Yeah. And please don't forget to go follow them they would actually change your perspective about a lot of things. And there's a resource link pinned right in on, on the comments. So don't forget to like, go uh, check out that as well. So I think it's really important for us to educate ourselves. And just like Sunny said, we are trading. It is never too late for you to be an activist. Mm -hmm. All that that's going to take of you is to share across the message, a simple Instagram post, starting a conversation in your family, going out in the street and talking to other people or getting on online on, uh, you know, social media and then starting like your own group and talking about it is some of the ways. And uh, for all the others who are like just getting started as activists, please don't shy away from either getting in touch with me or Sunny or anybody if you want to like, you know, uh, have some questions about activism or anything of that sort. So we'd be happy to have. Fantastic. So thank you so, so, so much, Sunny. I know it's been over an hour, but this has been such an insightful and, and such an intriguing conversation for me, especially. I'm sure for a lot of others as well. Um, I'm immensely grateful for the work that Global J Network is doing and I'm wishing you all the more strength and power for it. I'm looking forward to more and more discussions, even on Clubhouse, even on otherwise. So uh, again, a quick reminder, don't forget to follow the Global J Network and the J Beacon Initiative. It would open your perspective about a lot of things. So uh, just really glad that we could have this conversation, Sunny. It was, it's been a great time conversing with you ever since I first like, met you. And even now, it's good to see you as well. So thank you so much. This really bad. No, I, yeah. And I just want to thank you as well. Thank you for like this opportunity. Um, really grateful to have these conversations. And I know there's so many people that have joined us today that uh, may have not known about this or may or maybe are listening to these conversations for the first time. And, um, right. you know, just, yeah, really grateful. Thank you all again for being a part of this. And also follow Bunch as well. Let me make sure I say that because, uh, you know, Bunch, Bunch's Instagram page is doing incredible work. Um, you know, she's had multiple like, conversations like this with different people. And uh, I think 
you know, this is a great opportunity for us, whether, you know, wh whichever community you're from, to learn about how we can help animals. Because I think that is our ultimate goal that brings us all together.